So measuring outcome over effort, what's the actual difference between that? Like, what's the difference between an outcome-driven business and, like, an output-driven business? I think for us at Kempro, what we really try and focus on is putting the customer and the patient at the centre of everything we do. And I think that's obviously very relevant to measuring outcomes because I, I think in business we can all easily measure, you know, a lot of the KPIs and metrics in terms of our outputs. But if we really focus on the customer and ensure that everything we do is delivering a positive outcome for them, then that's a way we can really focus on outcomes, which as you've alluded to, is really important in a business. And that's certainly what we try and do with our group of pharmacies, particularly focusing on being a health business, mm -hmm. um, how we can deliver positive health outcomes for our consumers and our customers and really make a difference to their health and well-being. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So is that sort of like what you're sort of reminding your staff? Like they're not just doing those in-home visits, they're actually like making a real difference to people's health. Exactly right. I think that's certainly part of the culture of all of our staff across, across our 83 pharmacies. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all run individually um, by uh, individual owners and we've got a great team of staff in every one of those pharmacies who really focus on how they can engage with the customers or patients as we commonly refer um, to them and how they can deliver a healthcare service, whether it be a, a you know, flu vaccination or a medication pack or um, blood pressure monitoring, all these sorts of services that we provide that can deliver a positive health outcome to them. And then we also make sure that we follow up with you know, a lot of our patients afterwards and make sure that the services or the health solutions we offer actually have made a difference. And that just comes back to the fact that we, we really try and build relationships with our customers and get to know them a lot of the time by name. And that gives us the opportunity to really measure those outcomes as we um, go down the track. So. Great. And what about you guys? I know you're a bit of a different space, like not business to consumer, but business yeah. to business. Yeah, and, and I think long gone are the days of, of wanting your staff to work 80 hours. Um, for those of you that saw the presentation before, absenteeism is a real thing. And uh, encouraging your staff to work 80 hours is, is actually not good for anyone in the long run. Um, so we really focused on making sure that staff work the only the hours that they need to work to get the job done. And, uh, and, send, and I send them home. And if they're, if they're still there, then it's a conversation about what's going on. Have you got too much work? Or do you need training or support to, to get your work done? We really don't want heroes saying, I got here at four o'clock in the morning and I'm here working till 10. You know, sometimes in a startup environment, yeah, you might have days like that, but that shouldn't be a continuous pattern. So my thing for, for my team is really that focus on, hey, it's not about how long you're here. Because there's another thing called presenteeism. People sitting there for that long, but really they're on Facebook and mucking around anyway. So you, they're really not uh, getting the outcomes that you, you're after. So it's about delivering the outcomes in the time that they, they should be able to get it done. Mm. I remember that was like kind of a surprising thing for me when I sort of started in the workforce. Like we are at a time and attendance cost, uh, company. So when I was looking, working long hours, I was like clocking in being like, now Jake can see I worked this long today. And then when we had that discussion being like, well, why are you working so much? I was like, oh, like, aren't uh, you impressed by that? So, um, but now being as a team leader, when I see the staff hanging back, I'm like, guys, like, I'm not expecting you to be here. Like if you, you want to go home, have that work life balance, that's so, so very important. So. Um, yeah, that's a big sort of learning lesson there. So if, if you've got people in the audience right now who are thinking, okay, maybe I am a little bit more output driven than outcome driven, how do you sort of recommend you start that process to start going, okay, we've got a problem here, how do I start addressing that? Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, uh, so at Orion, we, uh, we work with a lot of different kinds of businesses across lots of different industries um, of different sizes and complexities. Um, and you, it's definitely important when we're talking about outcome focus to find a solution that's right for you. There are a lot of tools and processes, et cetera, that you can be using um, to, to monitor outcomes and an employee's contribution towards those. Um, and I think sometimes... Um, Across the board, we have a tendency to get a bit bogged down in that. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a full-blown process for your business. It depends on the maturity of the business and how, and how your staff will react to it and how you, your capacity to roll it out as well. Um, keeping people outcome-focused is at its core about communication. It's about alignment of the people towards the business and it's about monitoring and celebrating that when it's successful. So if you have a good communication method in place that allows you to actively share the outcomes that you expect to get from 
that employee's contribution, how that contributes to the overall outcome of the business, um, that you make sure that those are aligned, that you monitor it regularly, and that depends uh, on the business that we're talking about. It could be that you have a more structured conversation with an individual employee every week. It could be down to something like a structured performance program where you have reviews and appraisals, etc. If anybody needs one of those, they can come and see me about it after the break and get a free pizza. Um, but yeah, that's yeah, communication, alignment, and then the continual monitoring and celebration of it when you get the outcomes as well. That's a very important part that you can't skip out on, um, yep. is that you have to celebrate it when it gets to, to, the, to the crunch point. Yeah, well, even just to take a step back for a second then, how do you decide what, is, what are the right outcomes? What should you be focusing on? Is that, and like, more importantly, who gets involved in that discussion? For us, um, again, Caitlin, yeah, being in the, the healthcare space, it's really just focused on... You know, the, the, the fact is that pharmacy is the most regularly visited uh, healthcare destination in the country. So we know that on average, um, an Australian will visit a pharmacy 14 times per year. So it just gives us such a good opportunity to regularly interact with so many of our patients, get to know them, and focus on what are the solutions that we can provide to them. And at Kempro, we've got what we call a, a patient-centric model, which is all about, as I referred to earlier, putting the patient at the centre of everything we do, and it's really focused on um, you know, determining what the needs of that patient are, um, and then providing the relevant solutions, services, and then we know that that ultimately will result in the, the customer coming back to us and being more loyal to us as a business. So I think you know, a lot of the metrics in terms of business you know, revenue and, and profitability are a byproduct of ensuring that you, have, you are delivering those outcomes, because you know that those customers will be, will be loyal and continue coming back to you. I think the, the key to that too is if you know your customer, as the guy from Customology was talking about before, if you can understand your customer or your client and what they want, that's step one. Uh, and having, as Jake said this morning, your frontline people, they're the best to identify that. Uh, and then communicate that back to the rest of your team and say, this is how I identified what this person wanted, this is how I actioned it, and this is how we got the outcome that they're after. So it's really about the communication, but also the sharing within your team to say, well, we have all this information, now let's act on it and get the result for the client or the customer. Yeah, it's really cool to hear um, that it is more like a team decision, because traditionally it was more like managers came up with the outcomes, they sort of talked to the team and said, this is what we're wanting to achieve and this is what you have to do to achieve it. But now it's a little bit more where not just having your team involved, you talked a little bit there about having your customers involved in that, and that's how you decide your outcomes. And I know that's something that we like very much here do at Tander as well. Like this weekend, we have our sort of retreat. We're planning our outcomes, and um, <laughs> after this conference, a lot of us are powering through and like doing that weekend of coming up with our outcomes ourselves. So we've talked a lot now about like ha having these outcomes, why they're important to have them, and how um, you should get your staff involved. So when things are going great, how do you celebrate? Paul wants to give you the microphone. Oh, he's yeah. thinking of an answer. No. <laughs> um, how do you celebrate? So uh, one thing I'll say about celebrate, going back to the idea of uh, outcomes being driven by a team, celebration is also driven by a team of people as well. And it is a discipline in a business rather than a point in time thing. So one of the things that Tamsin said yesterday, actually, in his opening address was interesting for me, um, success being the ultimate mastery of work. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things to consider in that statement, um, and one of them is potentially not such a great one. It's the idea that uh, success is a point-in-time thing rather than a journey. So there are lots of different individual successes that contribute to the overall successful completion of an outcome. And it's very important um, as a group to celebrate those when they happen. Um, having said that, it's not necessarily a management-led thing. So you don't have to put on the staff drinks. We don't have to go on the team outing. Um, it's not the pub lunch. It can be as simple as encouraging people to share feedback in a structured and meaningful way with each other, as well as supplementing that with some uh, your managerial processes that ensure that you're having that regular feedback and recognition and reward. Yeah. Well, with that, then, when, you, when you've got a team that are all sort of together in the same physical location, it can be quite easy for, like, a staff member that they see the person next to them working hard and they can go, like, I can see you're working hard. Thank you very much. What happens when it comes to businesses that uh, grow larger and you're not in the same location anymore? How do you still foster that same environment? Yeah, sure. A couple of examples I can give are that 
um, for our 83 pharmacies, we have a head office, which is basically a support office. Uh, and we have what we call monthly team leaders meetings, where the managers of all those pharmacies come together on a monthly basis at a head office. Um, and basically, that's a great opportunity to recognize uh, you know, some great performances amongst so many of those staff members. Um, and we we're able to recognize them there in terms of a lot of the targets that have been met. We've also got um, an end of year function uh, where we basically give out uh, quite a number of different um, prizes for things like pharmacist of the year, uh, team leader of the year, and, um, and, and all those sorts of things. So at a sort of head office high level, I think it's, it's a great opportunity to, to recognize those individual staff members that are doing a fantastic job um, and, and recognize them in front of you know, the entire uh, group that we have. Yeah. So with that recognition then, does it always have to be something big like that where it's like an award or what are the sort of little things that you can do every day? Well, I think one of the other core things is making it personal, not just to the team, but to the person. Um, if you've got a staff member who loves to go to the ballet and, and they overperform, uh, you know, two tickets to the ballet, uh, where it might be for another staff member, two tickets to the footy or, or whatever the case might be. But if you can personalise that reward... Uh, and even personalise the celebration to some degree. Some staff are shy. They don't want that celebration to be in front of everyone. Other staff, they really appreciate the fact not only for the tickets, but they want to get pumped up in front of the whole team. So you've got to, you've got to really personalise the celebration, I think, down to the, to the team member, I reckon. Yeah, exactly. Like, I was just thinking, so in our team a lot, when someone does something well, we get maxi bonds for the team. So that's that little ice cream that's like a sandwich. And I kept giving them to Dan, one of my team members, who might be out here in the audience somewhere. But... He wasn't really eating them, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I'm like, why isn't he appreciating my gift? And he was allergic. So um, <laughs> that's why it's really good to personalise these gifts and make sure you know what's going on. So, <laughs> yes, and I, I was like, Dan, you probably should have told me you're allergic to nuts like before eight months into this. So, um, But, yeah, that's really awesome, being able to personalise them for an employee. In, when you think back on your time in the workforce, is there a little gesture that sort of really sticks in your mind where – it meant a lot when someone just made a small, small gesture, or a big uh, gesture. Yeah, I think small gestures, um, as you alluded to, are really, really important as well. And I know my time uh, being a pharmacist and managing a pharmacy for quite a number of years. Uh, just the fact of you know actually pulling someone aside for you know just a minute or two and just congratulating them when they've done something really well or just thanking them for their hard work is really important. And just acknowledging them when they see that their manager or the owner of the business, you know. Um, is recognising the, the great work that they've done. I think that's just so important. So it could just be something as small as that, I think, and that's certainly part of our culture and something that I'm sure you know, so many of our, our pharmacy owners do at an individual pharmacy level. Yeah. So any particular instance that you can think of? Not for, not for me personally, but we, we run an MVP. So wherever our staff are, everyone can nominate an MVP, so nominate someone else, talk about the, the, exper uh, the environment that it happened in, who else was involved, what clients, what other team members, uh, and then someone becomes the MVP for the month and we have a wheel and you spin the wheel and the wheel doesn't have uh, thousands of dollars or cars, it has you know, a, a blow wave or a six pack or leave, uh, have a day off work, those small things and, uh, and it's sort of a celebration where those small things get, get brought out. So I think that's one, uh, one way that is practical and particularly if you're a startup and you don't have a heap of cash, the small things that are fun and, and people can get engaged in uh, are really good ways to keep, uh, keep people up and about. Yep. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. I was about to say, what sort of effect does that have on your, your bottom line there if you were spending all that money on cash and other little gifts like that? Is there ever a point that you're like, okay, we need to, we need to draw a line here. We're spending a lot on this. Well, hopefully the outcomes that you're getting <laughs> yeah. are paying for the uh, yeah. rewards that you're giving out. Mm -hmm. And it is an interesting thing about measuring outcomes when we're talking about whether it's good for your bottom line. Uh, probably the first line about that is... is um, it should never be just about financial performance. Um, but then the second line about that is, of course, that it's always about financial performance. So the reason we train people on outcomes is because we want to get uh, better financial outcomes for the business. Um, so going back to something that Damien said before, the idea of uh, there's, there's people on Facebook a lot of the time. So there's actually a very famous quote, but I can't, I can't for the life of me remember who it was from now. I'll find out later and share it with everybody um, at the stand. Uh, but it basically goes something like, at any given point in time in your workforce, there's 50% of people who aren't doing what they're doing. And of those 50%, the, the, Oh, and of, those, of that 50%, 50% of those people are actually never doing what they're doing. So it's the job of a manager to try and figure out who those people are um, and want not to... It's not like a big game of laser tag. I don't think you go around and sort of hunt them out that way. Um, but it is... Uh, 
basically to try and figure out how to make those people more productive. So this is, of course, um, the, the major bottom line impact of not being outcome focused is that people are less productive. Mm -hmm. um, and productivity, is, it, it doesn't mean that they're, they're not producing as much, that they're, not, that they're on Facebook or that they're uh, having extra breaks, etc. Um, it generally means that somebody who's a bit more out, output focused, their output is directed in a way that doesn't actually address the strategy of the business. So you might have be a very well-intentioned employee and you're engaged in something that you think contributes to that output with, but without the communication, without the monitoring and the reaffirmation of what you're doing, you can very quickly get off track. Yeah, well, that actually links to one of the questions we just had from the audience. So how do you ensure team members are on the same page as management about how well they are achieving outcomes? There's really one word for this one and I would like to make it an easy one, <laughs> but that word is communication. So the only way that you can keep that alignment is to communicate. So whether that's through some sort of formal structure of communication, whether that's performance reviews, for example, if you have a structured performance process, or whether that's the weekly catch-up. If you use something like Agile, for example, there will be a lot of technology people, I think, in the room. So Agile is a way in which we're able to communicate that here are a lot of outcomes that we need to achieve as a group and how you know, in a daily way, usually through some sort of stand-up, you'll be communicating with each other that this is how you've achieved it. So it's all about different forms of communication and how they fit into your business to keep everybody trained on that. Yeah. I'd, I'd add to that too. Is you need to sort of have an opportunity to say, well, what happens when we don't get the outcome and how do you fix it? Um, allowing your staff the, the ability to say, I think I got that one wrong. Uh, how do we fix it for next time for me and for everyone else so that no one else has to learn the same lesson? And, and having the faith, and I think uh, Jake spoke about it earlier today, uh, give people the opportunity to go, I don't know, and, and figure it out, and then come back and learn, and, and then share that back with the team so that everyone learns, uh, and you don't have to have the same mistake or the same uh, handling uh, happen more than once, because obviously your client or your customer is still uh, most important, but you still need to make sure that your team has the opportunity to learn and to grow. Yeah, so you touched on there having the opportunity. So even sometimes I find when you give staff the opportunity, it, it's not just giving them that time, but you have to give them the um, like encouragement and the feeling safety to actually take that opportunity and talk to you where there's concerns. So how do you sort of create that culture where people can feel like they can be vulnerable and they can make mistakes and that if they do make mistakes, that you're going to be there to support them and sort of work through it with them? I think, I know it's a term that's probably used quite often in business, but it's culture, I think, within the business. And it's about making sure that you're all part of the same family. And I know at Kempro, we certainly focused on having a sort of family atmosphere, having people that are, as we were talking about earlier, on the same page, that share the same common values, um, that really um, realise the importance of the role that staff play in your business. As we all know in business, they're the most important asset a business has, is, is your staff. So when you have that culture and you know that the manager or the business owner is going to be approachable as a staff member, I think that's really important. Um, and just genuinely engaging with your staff is so important. I know at pharmacy level, quite often we've got you know staff meetings, as I'm sure many businesses do, whether it's yours or others, and just a wonderful opportunity for them to raise any questions, any concerns they have, and then let's just all have a discussion about it and, and you know, think about what the best way forward is as well. And um, having a really good HR um, department, I think, is fantastic as well, which we've got at Kempro. Um, and having, you know, that support there from a HR level um, for all of our pharmacies is, is really integral that, to, to that aspect as well. I think also it's got to be authentic. Uh, you mentioned the word genuine and, and listening to Alex earlier, his, his method is what's, what's authentic to him is people um, making fun of him along the way. And that, that's what works for him because it's genuinely how he is. I don't think you can manufacture this. I think you need to be you and you need to give your team the opportunity to see you and how you operate uh, and then build that safe environment around you being you so that they can be them and then uh, build on from that. Awesome. Well, to jump back to Paul, what you were saying before when you called it a, a family, we had another question in the audience from uh, Rod at Tanda, actually. He said, I've worked at two places, Flight Centre and Tanda, where the culture has been so good that in a joke it's become a bit of a cult. <laughs> um, is there a danger that culture becomes clicky? Is it a good or a bad thing if that does happen? Oh. <laughs> Yes, there is a danger of that. <laughs> um, so, and the danger comes um, from the fact that, yeah, I'll try to figure out how to, how to explain it. Um, it becomes a little bit exclusive and not inclusive. And that's, that's the aim yeah. of a good communication 
um, strategy within your business is that it makes everybody feel included. Yep. So you'll have people who potentially, um, if, if we look at some of the impacts of having a culture that becomes a bit like a cult, um, because of its perceived exclusivity, you can actually be actively um, sort of discouraging talent that could otherwise have been coming in your, into your business. Um, it will have the effect of that. You will hear some people, you know, talk about like the Googles of the world and go, I would never work there mm -hmm. because they perceive the culture externally to be a particular way. Um, so what you really need to be aiming for when we're talking about culture is that you make sure that it is inclusive. So that if you've got... It's definitely the imperative of a business to build a team that addresses the needs of that business. And sometimes you will have to have values that you... What, you not sometimes, always. You should have values that you demonstrate to your workforce and to the, the customer community that you deal with. Um, but you must make sure to that, that they're always inclusive, that, you, that, that we don't deliberately exclude anybody based upon the fact that we don't think that they're going to be um, a good fit based on a culture that's sort of not what it actually is. I can't mm. think of a better way to explain that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, that's all right. But so... If you start to feel like, okay, maybe we do have a culture that's not including everyone, where's the first step? What do you, how do you start to change that? Because like culture is something that um, can be really hard to change in a way. Like once you've got a culture, whether or, like, whether or not you're aware of it, you do have a culture. And then when you do become aware of it, changing that culture, that can be a really hard process. So if you start to go, okay, I think I've got a culture that's not inclusive to these people or a certain type of personality, how do you even start to make that change? You must ask people at this point. So finding out how engaged your employees are, um, what actively disengages them or, more, or, or proves to be more engaging for them is definitely something that, you, that anybody needs to do in order to maintain the culture within their business anyway. So it's about constant communication with uh, employees about what is engaging, what is disengaging, and then being perceived by, by your workforce as well. So you do have to take action on the back of that analysis. You have to come up with an action plan and commit to that action plan. So that builds within your employees is a sense of trust that you're actually going to do it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I think the other thing you can do also, which it sounds like Tand has done recently, is as uh, from the top of the company, you need to empower the people at the next level down and then go away and see what happens. Because culture really is what happens when the people who have been watching over everyone and making sure everyone's doing the right thing, what happens when they're not there, that's what culture is. So you need to get your next line down and empower them and say, we're going to go and you need to monitor and see what happens and see where the holes are. Because that, that is a whole different insight into the way people are operating. If they see the manager walk out the door at lunchtime and then they muck around for the rest of the afternoon, then you know you've got a culture issue. Um, but you're not going to see that if you're in the business and you, you need to empower the, the senior managers around you to make sure that they are then actively looking for uh, and conscious of any changes in activity and behaviours uh, of the team when that happens. Mm -hmm. We had a question from the audience. Is, is there ever a point where, um, like, trying to fix culture isn't going to be possible or it isn't fixable I and mean, which battles do you choose like is there times where you have to like yeah pick your battles and go okay maybe that one will let slide but we address that is that sort of a thing I think it's all, always possible to, to focus on improving your culture um, and I think that yeah for me I don't, I don't think you can get to a point where you just you know think it's a lost battle or anything like that um, in terms of the overall culture of, of a business I think it's just something that continuously needs to be worked on um, whether it be that you have monthly staff meetings, whether it be that in some of our pharmacies we go out for monthly staff dinners um, and all just get to know each other on a bit more of a social level as well. Um, all those sorts of things are just so important, but I think it's just something that certainly needs a lot of focus and um, particularly from the business owner and the manager down. And I really agree with what Damon was saying in terms of empowering uh, the, the other staff within your business as well. That's something that we really focus on is a lot of our managers aren't necessarily the owner of a business, but they do an absolutely fantastic job in managing it. Um, and they really help to improve the culture within the business as well. Because when other staff see that there's someone who, you know, is an employee, they're not necessarily the owner, but they're managing it, they really care about it, that flows through to other staff, I think, as well. Yeah, leading by example. Yeah. Awesome. And then we had one more question that said, when you encourage people to have fun in the office, how do you manage bringing someone back to focus on outcomes who has not been as productive as they could be? How do you manage the staff member saying other people are doing an excuse? It's a tricky question. Who's up to the challenge? <laughs> no, um, I think uh, it's all about boundaries and expectations. Um, and the fundamentals are... What, what is the expectation and what's been set out at the start? 
Um, what's really hard to do is call people on behaviour or activity that is not outlined from the start uh, with policies or, or meetings or um, some form of communication to say, look, this is when we have a good time and this is when we need to, to really buckle down and, and get into it. And it's really difficult if you don't, haven't had that conversation up front to then say, look, sorry, uh, mate, that behaviour is not, not acceptable. And you're like, well, hang on, these people have been doing it over here and I saw all those people doing it over there. Why is what I'm doing? I don't understand. So you've got to have that conversation up front. And uh, if it comes to the part where, or to the point where you've had that conversation and the person says, I don't understand, then you need to go back and say, okay, I understand. We have an unwritten ground rule uh, and everyone's been following it. Maybe we need to write that down and make sure everyone knows what it is. So that would be my suggestion. Yeah, okay. I think just making sure everyone's on the same page is absolutely crucial, again, as Damien alluded to. And for us, we just really make sure we have a very clear strategy um, that you know, in terms of what our business is about. In our case, it's about being leaders in providing healthcare solutions to, to everyday Australians. And um, I think if every staff member is very clear on what that strategy is, um, that's really gonna help, help out a lot. And we just make sure that at an individual pharmacy level, every single one of them know what our vision is, what our values are, and, and what our strategy is moving forward, and what are the key areas of focus for us to be able to achieve that strategy. Yeah, okay. So it was saying a lot now that it sounds like we, you should be writing sort of these things down by the sounds of it anyway. But is there ever a point where it's like, you know, actions will always trump words. So if there's a point where people are starting to, yeah, the actions are just not aligning to the words, is it ever a case where maybe the words aren't correct? Maybe you should be reviewing your own policy. Um, yeah, there's definitely that. So um, as, as a business, it's important that if you have structures in place, um, to safeguard your culture and to ensure that people feel empowered within that culture, that everybody within uh, certainly the, the leadership structure of your business, so that's from, from the lowest point of management that you have within your business all the way up, um, understands that and contributes to it. So it's definitely, yeah. <laughs> that's all right. I'll just quickly check if we had another question there that I think I missed. But... Sorry, I was, I was just like gonna, loading, but not loading. <laughs> just to add on the communication piece, for us, we found a couple of really valuable tools are having um, what we call a, an online platform, which you know has all the information available in terms of policies, procedures, um, all sorts of different documents relating to marketing or HR that you know is accessible at an individual store level. And, and that's certainly having everything in one place, and I'm sure many large organisations do, really helps to, to have that clarity. And again, just regular... Um, monthly meetings that I referred to earlier, the team leaders meetings, a great opportunity to communicate new strategies, new um, services we offer, um, new programs we're doing, and just making sure everyone's on the same page. So. Perfect. And then, so we talk a lot about, about like celebrating success. How do you treat the times when you aren't reaching your outcomes, where things maybe aren't going as so great, staff are a little bit not motivated? What do you think is the best sort of thing to do in that situation? So going back to the idea that um, success is the journey rather than the point, um, even when things don't reach uh, the outcome that you'd expected, there's still success that should be celebrated along the way. And if you adopt a method that's more about periodic um, celebration of the fact that they've been tasks completed, um, it can lessen the blow when you get to the point that you don't get the outcome. You know, the ultimate example of this is budget. So, you know, you, everybody works really hard every year. Uh, sorry, every month we, we, we achieve our targets and then we have a couple of slack months and then we get to the end of the year and, oh dear, we haven't made our, our annual forecasted budget. Um, so, you, you know, this is, this is a real testing point for a lot of management groups because, of course, you've got a bunch of people who are like, we worked really hard here, um, but we haven't achieved the expected outcome. And a lot of the time, the outcome will not be about individual contributions per se. It will be about that, you know, there might be some issues with the strategy of the business, for example. The economic conditions could have changed things about your forecast. A lot of unknowns. So I think if you get into a place where you celebrate smaller successes, but then you look at how they contribute to an overall outcome. So there's like a cascading kind of alignment of goals between people. So if I understand what my goals are, I understand what my manager's goals are, I understand what their manager's goals are, and I understand what the business is, if that's your structure, um, then it makes it easier for me to understand that, okay, I as an individual might have 
been successful, but us as a business, not as successful as we would have hoped. So it makes it a little bit easier to understand if you have that continual flow of communication and celebration of success, rather than you get to a point and sort of go, well, we've all missed it. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just add to that too? You need to empower your people along the way to be able to say, well, we're not looking like we're going to achieve it. I've got an idea of how we might be able to fix it and give them some, some um, opportunity to raise those ideas uh, and to be taken on board. Now, not every idea is a good idea and you're not going to do everything that every employee suggests, but the people that are at the coalface are the ones that know what's going on the most. And, and if they come with an opportunity and you're already not succeeding, well, in some cases, you might not have a lot to lose to try. Maybe you do a, a pilot somewhere with a, a small market or with a small client, um, but you have an opportunity to then not only turn it around and, and reach that uh, monthly target or the annual target, but also then empower, having empowered your staff member, celebrate their success and their involvement in it. So you can have a double win. Uh, so I'd really focus on, in the, in the tough times, give people a voice. Yep. Awesome. And then in the tough times, like, is, are people using technology to help identify when they're having tough times? Like, how do you even know you have a tough time if no one's really talking about it? Oh, I just think technology is so important when it comes to that, Caitlin. Um, you know, certainly in terms of the systems we use, whether it be our point of sale system, our dispensing system, um, uh, you know, to analyze and, and review um, our business continuously. Um, it's just a really valuable tool. Uh, and of course, it's going to provide you with the tools to, to have all your metrics in front of you, but then you've got to be able to take the next step and speak to your staff about it and see what areas uh, need to be improved. Um, we also have another online, um, sorry, another software program called um, Guild Link, which is what we use to record all of the health services that we provide, whether it be a vaccination or a medication review and, and those sorts of so services. Um, and everything obviously is recorded on there. And that's just another great um, piece of technology that's really valuable to us in pharmacy in terms of looking at what are the services we provide, are they relevant to consumers, and have they delivered better patient outcomes, and just have it all there in front of you is just really fantastic. Perfect. And then both of you guys being in the software industry, where do you sort of see them, that role going in the future? Where do you think software will play a part? Um, so software... So I'll answer this question in a couple of ways. So uh, technology is, is an important enabler of a process that allows you to engage people and celebrate success, measure outcomes, etc. Um, but it's definitely not a necessity, which is strange for a software vendor to sit on a stage and say, I'll put out there. Um, so whatever tools you have at your disposal, you should be employing those to ensure that you have a qualitative system um, for measuring what your outcomes are, communicating those to everybody and allowing people to monitor themselves. So that's another really good point. It's not, um, we shouldn't just put it into the hands of managers to be communicating um, whether we're successful. We should be transparent about that information. So one of the classic examples is that, that we strike in a lot of corporate environments is how much they're willing to share about financial performance, actually, is. We're sort of, oh, yes, we share it all the way down to, you know, frontline employees know exactly how much money we, we make all the way to it's very close to the chest kind of thing. And it depends very much on the business. But regardless of the business, there should be a qualitative and sort of measurable and demonstrated way, whether that's a spreadsheet all the way through to a proper people and payroll management solution, for example, that shows you what's going on. Um, so that's, yeah, that's one part of the answer from a, from a technology perspective, I guess. Um. I think it's really important that, that you have software there for the black and white, you've ticked a box, you've read this, et cetera, but you need people and you need communication for the gray areas. People can't communicate with computers. You need to sit down and have a face-to-face -face conversation. So it's yes, there's definitely a place for software and it's really important for record keeping and, and reminders and those sorts of things, but that nothing beats sitting across the desk. And I would recommend uh, if your team's small enough to have a, an informal conversation every month uh, it doesn't have to be structured, just how are you? Don't, not even how, how are you going for your goals, but just how are you as, an, as, an, as a person? Uh, and then from there, if you're okay, well then how's business and how's everything going? Yeah, that's definitely something that can't be underestimated. The effect of a bit of positive attention mm -hmm. towards an employee on productivity is huge, actually. Yeah. And even jumping on that, the same thing for the manager. Like I know one of my staff member the other day, end of financial year, things are a bit crazy. And she just pulled me inside and said, I just wanted to ask how you are, how are you going? And it was something that I'd sort of forgotten about. Like, just, you never sort of sometimes ask your managers. You sort of expect for them to be sort of checking on you, see how you're going. And then when it comes the other way, that's so, oh, I just remember Yaz, if she's in the crowd right now. Thank you, Yaz. Um, it, it just made such a world of difference, just being asked, how are you as a person? Not 
Tanda, not Caitlin. I just want to know how you are. And that was really nice. So one last question from the audience, as I know we do have time wrapping up here. What happens when you have two teams that work well as individual teams, so two small teams that work really well, but in both of them working well, they sort of are fighting against each other. How do you sort of approach that issue? Um, uh, from my experience, um, as you said, it, sometimes it can work well because it, there's some competition there, which isn't always a bad thing when it comes to, to um, there being some competition amongst staff, but it needs to be obviously friendly competition. and, and yeah. But, you know, there's been instances, um, you know, where we've, I know the pharmacies I'm involved in, we've had two that are, are near each other and, you know, we, 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 they might compete, but again, it's friendly. It's not, you know, there's not, there's not acrimonious or anything like that. And it's just all about, you know, how can we serve our customers, serve their needs, and ultimately it's going to deliver really good um, patient outcomes, health outcomes. But um, I, I think it's a good thing, but they still work together in, in certain ways as well. If one pharmacy tries something that they find works well yeah. as a new idea, they can speak to the other pharmacy about it as well, because at the end of the day, we're part of the same brand, which is ChemPro, so we want our brand to be successful. Exactly. That was what I was going to say as well. It's just you remind everyone that even though you are in your smaller teams, you are part of one large team, one large family, or like aiming towards the same goal. Yeah. And reminding people of that vision or purpose that we're all here, what is our shared goal? You, you, you can't actually have contention. If we're all shooting towards that, there, there can't be contention. So sometimes just reminding everyone, well, your role is this, my, our role is this, together we perform this, and that's how we all get to where we need to go. So just reminding people of the shared purpose, I think, is important. Yeah. And so just to finish off, if, if everyone's going, okay, really good ideas, so many ideas, what should I like do on Monday? What's one thing that you recommend starting straight away, something simple that you can just put in place on Monday to start maybe changing your culture or to being more celebrating success or focusing on outcomes? So one really quick one that I can suggest, and it's really cheap and effective in any kind of, of business, um, is something that we call within Orion a sunshine note. So I've seen a lot of businesses have them as well. I actually see a lot of my friends post their corporate version of them um, on Facebook. Um, so a sunshine note is essentially something that we all have on our desks. They're little white pieces of paper with um, a smiley sort of sun shape at the top. Um, and they basically use so that you can tell somebody else uh, in your team or your workforce that they've done a good job at something. Um, and it's one of the easiest ways of fostering relationships and celebration of success within a business. Now, having said that, it doesn't need to be something about you could just put a note that you like somebody's hair. For example, I would suggest that you check your, your individual workplace policies before you That's get That's a HR issue, but... don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, it, it's, it's very much about reaffirmation that then spreads as a discipline across the group. And the other thing, it's very cheap and effective. Any kind of business can implement this kind of, kind of solution. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mine would be book a 15-minute catch-up with everyone in your team with no purpose other than just to check how they are and just see where it goes and see what you learn because I'm sure you'll learn something if you set the right environment where they're safe uh, and confident to talk. Uh, you'll learn something maybe about them, maybe about their role, maybe about the business overall. For me, one thing I found that's worked really well, which I mentioned earlier, was awards, but um, not just awards, but we also have um, staff members nominating other staff members for a particular awards, so their peers nominating them. and. Um, I heard from one particular staff member who's, who's won an award um, last year, I think it was, and she basically said just to be recognised and you know by one of my fellow colleagues, and um, it's just something I never would have thought about. And she was just absolutely over the moon and just wrapped about the fact that you know someone else had actually even nominated her yeah. uh, for an award. Awesome. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today, but um, they are on the Hoover app. So if you have any questions that we didn't get to, feel free to leave them there. We'll be checking those and we can respond there. But thank you so much for your time, guys. And I think we've got some good ideas that we're going to go ahead and implement on Monday. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. Thank you.